No, your your thread wraps. You want to make oh. sure they're perfectly side by side. Oh, this is just for a tag, like on this. This is, is going to be the rib, but you're not going to not going to need that. Darling, we might not ever look like those families In the stock picture frames on old-time TV My name is Will Bush. I'm a professional fly tire. I specialize in Atlantic salmon patterns and steelhead patterns. I'm an avid tackle collector. I fish for uh, steelhead all over British Columbia. And I, yeah, <laughs> that's me. We're two runaways on a one way ticket track. And if I'm not the man you bargained for, and the bright red love you bought me for is gone, will you lie? Under star down skies and look me in the eyes when I say these are our hard times. Okay, so obviously a big part of your life is learning and uh, the history of flies. And if you want to maybe talk to us about some of your favorite flies and give us the history of them. Um, yeah, I think, well, like I said earlier when we were on the river, um, a lot of my, a lot of my interest for for some of the historical patterns um, revolves around uh, tires that used uh, rather unique materials. Um, this fly here is the, the Childers. Uh, this was a very common pattern. Uh, you'll see it in Farlow's or Hardy's uh, and many other uh, tackle dealers back in the day. And um, so this is, uh, this particular one here, it's got actual Banksy and Cockatoo in the wing, which I think just, it's a little bit of a contrast um, to most of them. And I, I just I just think this particular pattern looks super neat. Uh, all the other children's patterns, they don't have Banksy in the wing. Um, and uh, I don't know, I just find, I find the, in, the, the tires out there that used interesting materials to tie uh, common patterns. I, I really enjoy that aspect of it. And then this pattern here, this is the Black Wasp uh, from Francis. And uh, it's got uh, duck actually married into the wing, which is one of the things that I'm currently working on, trying to get better at. It's very uh, a very difficult task in tying Atlantic salmon flies. Most of the time I don't hit it right, but on this particular fly, it did turn out quite well. But it's one of the one of the things I find most enjoyable is all the practice that you get and try and try again till you get it right. Uh, this is one of the patterns from uh, Jones Guide to Norway. This is one of my other favorite patterns. This one's called the Assassin. It also has Banksy and Cockatoo in the wing, and it's such a dark pattern with the claret and the blues. And then you can probably see it's got the the uh, blue and yellow macaw and the horns. And I, I always thought that that pops out and almost looks electric on this pattern. It's, uh, that this, this particular fly here has been with me for, I want to say almost 10 years. It's got uh, an eye made out of real silt gut and uh, it's landed multiple fish over the years. And just to show you the durability of a real silt gut, this, this thing's 
like I say, it's been in here for years. It's been wet and dry and wet and dry and still holds together quite well. Um, some of the other ones in here, uh, well, let's open a different box here. So these are all Sid Glasso patterns. Um, there's a couple uh, Wentworth patterns in there as well. Um, one of the things I've always tried to get good at is making Glasso patterns look nice. Um, I have never, I've never really been quite happy with the way I tie glasses. Uh, there's guys out there like Sean Dalquist that just seem to get, get them right every single time. Um, they just tie absolutely beautiful flies. Um, this, this one here, that's a Saul Dock. It's been a little beat up there, but, uh, that's tied on an old Willis hook. And I, I think Willis hooks have the, have the nicest, uh, proportions for tying glassos, but you hardly ever see them anymore, which is unfortunate. It's too bad there isn't a hook manufacturer out there that wants to bring back all the, the old hook patterns and everything, because in this day and age, they'd probably make a fortune because there's been, uh, there's been such a resurgence in tying classic Atlantic salmon flies. Um, yeah, this one here, this is a Wentworth pattern. This is the, uh, no, well, having a draw in a blank. <laughs> uh, Quilly, uh, And then, Kirk, you were asking me about the fly boxes earlier. Uh, this is a Hardy Naroda, um, deep fly box with the large, large salmon clips. And I, I believe these were made throughout the 30s and the 40s. And one of the ways you can tell the older ones apart is usually if they, the earliest ones, they all have a brass hinge on them. And uh, this particular one has all its original screws. And then as they got into the 40s with these, you'll notice that all the, the modeling got a little bit finer. And then, uh, then they went off onto a stainless steel hitch. So if you're, if you're looking for these, these are a little bit rare and a little bit hard to find. Um, and then these are the two patterns which I, I probably fish the most. Uh, as you can see, my box is almost full of them. There's Karens on the top, and there's Dallas on the bottom. Um, and then there's a few cauldrons there. Uh, the Karen pattern um, originally came from Arthur Edward Knox from Autumn on the, Autumns on the Spay, and the Dallas, uh, it, it, it's in a lot of the original books, uh, I think. Kelson published it, I think Francis published it. And then um, this this fly here is actually called the John Dallas. And they think maybe that this was the originator of the Dallas pattern, but this one here didn't have the rough in the head. And if you look at the Dallas, it's got that big tuft of bright color up at the front. And you can almost call that the precursor to the modern, modern egg sucking leech. But you actually saw this uh, tuft up at the front. It was quite common. If you look at the river Findhorn patterns or any of the snowfly patterns, they all had that tuft up there. So basically, the egg sucking leech isn't really a modern modern pattern. fishing to you? Well, this might require some thinking juice. <laughs> yeah. 
The culture of fly fishing. Um, I don't know if I can speak to the culture of fly fishing because my world of fly fishing is pretty insulated. I've never been saltwater fishing before. Um, so I think the culture of fly fishing to me is really steelhead and trout and um, I don't know. A lot of the culture for me is, is uh, gear orientated, I suppose, because I'm a collector of antique fishing equipment and um, I like old salmon flies and silk gut and yeah. Um, I suppose there's a lot more to it. There's the, a lot more could be done. There's a lot of us that kind of take advantage of it and don't give back. Um, I think nowadays with so few fish, at least in the steelhead world, people need to band together a little bit more and put a lot more pressure on governments and stuff because it's in the 25 odd years I've been doing this, it's disappearing rapidly. And then it's uh, quite heartbreaking actually. So what's a fly that when you sit down to tie, when you tie for enjoyment, what would you sit down and tie? Ooh, something ridiculously complicated. I like, uh, I like marrying duck into the wing. Uh, I like anything that's kind of unique. Um, unique feathers or um, a unique makeup or unique colors. There's so many flies in the classic library that, I don't know, it, it, there's, imp, there's a couple thousand at least. So there's always something that piques my interest. One thing I really don't like doing is tying the same fly over and over and over. It drives me insane. So on that kind of theme, is that because like you were, you'd mentioned the other time, some of the hardest materials to work with. Does it fall under that category? Oh, duck certainly does. Like whenever you're working with any kind of waterfowl, um, it's uh, very, very, very frustrating to marry into a wing. So it, uh, I don't know, I like the, I like the challenge of it because it doesn't really like to cooperate. So I like to prove to myself that I know what I'm doing, I guess. <laughs> if there was one material that used to be readily accessible when you started out that has gone by the wayside that you could have and you would mortgage to get your hands on it? Uh, probably more Katinga. Because when I first started tying flies, you could buy an entire Katinga skin for like 500 bucks. Now they're like three grand, if you can ever even find one. Because obviously it's a endangered species, so the only thing you get anymore is museum mounts or museum skins or anything that museums are done with and they sell off or whatever so there's a finite number of them so you just i don't know you just don't see them and it's it's in so many patterns that uh, it'd be nice to see more of that kind of stuff around but it's dwindling what's your favorite uh shape and style of hook um or is it fly dependent? I mean, obviously it's fly dependent, but. It's very fly dependent, but I really like old Harrison uh, limericks. Um, they're pretty cool. Um, one of my absolute favorite hooks is an old Millwards. Um, I love the shape of the old Millwards. I probably have about 30 or 40 of them and I, I don't sell those to people. I keep those for myself. <laughs> um, Ah, I, I like a limerick bend. Um, the Partridge CS 10 threes are pretty sweet. Uh, they always, um, they make a really nice fly. Obviously those are just for spay patterns, but. Have you ever found a material that had nothing to do with fly fishing 
that you saw and immediately incorporated in your tying? Um, there was something, but I can't remember what that is right now. Um, uh, <laughs> probably, um, <laughs> the bread loaf bags from, uh, save on because they're a little bit thicker and you can make a scud back out of them <laughs> <laughs> not the answer i was expecting but perfect hey recycling right yeah recycling. just feel guilty when i accidentally lose one on a fish because then i put plastic in the water yeah. and then i won't sleep that night Baby, I can't make a move like a child, a star for love. I stay there as long as I have to. I'll cry a river of tears that flows to the sea. Baby, if you run away, baby, if you leave. Make me feel brand new Come on, give it up to me Let me take care of you I know that your mama said I'm gonna make you cry all night I'll cry a river of tears That flows to the sea Baby, if you In the history of fly fishing, I know you're a collector of all things to make up that history. What would be your favorite piece that you have? Something that you would almost want to be cremated if you wanted to be cremated with. <laughs> something that's going to be, something that's always there that would be the first thought of your mind to grab in a fire. Ah, uh, I've got a 1917 three and a half Hardy Perfect with a line guard. Um, I got it from a friend of mine. I've never seen any other reel like it. Uh, it's kind of my, <laughs> that's my baby. I don't, I've only ever fished it once or twice and all my other reels I fish. Um, I've got a, I've got a four and three quarter hardy perfect and there's less than a handful of them ever made and I fished that. But that little three and a half for some reason, I don't know. I just like that little thing. <laughs> um, it's, uh, yeah, that'd be the first thing coming out of the fire. Yep. So obviously, in your, when you're collecting like tying materials, do you have any like old like like hooks and stuff like like things like that that you wouldn't tie on that you collect also because you're not... no, all the fly, all the fly tying stuff, um, that stuff's there to use. Otherwise, you're what are you you're just looking at it, um, and you just hold onto it and pass it on to the next person thirty years down the road when you're sick of looking at it, like fly tying stuff is there to use and if you don't use it what's like really what's the point in having it I, I i do have a couple of feathers that i'm saving for when i think my skills are good enough to to use um and they're not really any different from the other pair they're just kind of i don't know it's the the barring on the feather or how it looks or I don't know, but I'm just saving it for either when I get a good idea or when I think my my skills are optimum that week, I guess you'd say. Some days when you suck and there's some days when you're really fucking good at what you do. Most of the time you suck. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to see what suck looks like, that's in this box here because I usually sell all the good ones. I guess one of my favorite aspects of the sport uh, is I'm, I'm a collector. Um, I love vintage Hardy Perfects. They uh, they all have a lot of individual character, I think. They've been, had the finish worn off in different ways. And there's so many different variations of them. They all have a different check system, like a, a drag system in them. 
Um, you know, you, you, for the most part, you can tell them apart between the brass face in 1906, 1912s, 1917s, 20s, um, early 20s, 30s, and all the way into the enameled ones. Uh, there's so many of them to collect. Uh, this particular one here is a, an er, uh, early 1930s, I believe. Um, Jimmy Smith, three and a half. Uh, some of the different uh, the different the different ways to tell them apart is uh, the thinness of the of the drag knob, um, the the lettering on the faceplate. Uh, the lettering on the faceplate didn't come in until 1920. Uh, there was an odd series there, 1920 to 1921, where they still had white handles and yet they were doing the writing on the faceplate. And during that time, you see a lot of uh, a lot of really interesting variations. Uh, out of those 1917 years, like the, the World War I years. Um, a lot of them have, uh, obviously, the line guards. Um, a lot of them don't. Uh, I like to collect both of them. Uh, I've got quite a few. Uh, one of the interesting things you see once they got out of that 1920 uh, to 1921 period, uh, or sorry, 19, uh, what is it, 19... 1926 to 1928, after that, you started seeing the ribbed foot. Um, you started seeing that come into play. Uh, anything up to there, we call them smooth feet. And they, they, they were generally a, f a fair bit longer. Um, I didn't actually bring one today, but uh, <laughs> I should have to have an example. This particular reel here, uh, I believe I talked about it earlier. Um, this is a 1930s Jimmy Smith. Uh, with a medallion in the middle. Um, there's the odd one out there, not very many. This is the first three and three quarter I've ever seen. Um, early in the, uh, I guess it'd be 1905 period, 1906 period, you would see brass faced reels with a medallion in the middle and it'd actually say Hardy Brothers ball bearings in the middle. Um, they're quite interesting. There's very, very few of them out there. Uh, sometimes you see them brass face, sometimes you see them with the aluminum face plate, uh, but they're all at that 1906 check. Uh, I've seen very, very few of those. Uh, this little guy here, um, this is another 1930s three and, or three and a half, and this little fella here has had a lot of the finish worn off of it. Um, there's... There's some reels out there that we have called spitfires over the years because at some point there somebody made up a story or it's quite plausible that this story was made up that these reels were made out of the pistons um, from the spitfire airplanes. Uh, <laughs> I highly doubt that's true but the spitfire reels were completely unfinished so they're technically raw reels. Uh, as you can see, this one here, all the finish has been removed, uh, except for a little bit of the letting along here. This is not a Spitfire reel, uh, even though it begins to look like it. There was also reportedly, and I could have the placement wrong, but there was a gentleman in, in Germany quite long ago that was actually, this was like 30, 40 years ago, that was actually removing the finish off of the reels and selling them as Spitfires. Um, but there are a fair amount of true Spitfires out there. Uh, they were made by two reel makers. I can't remember the one off the top of my head, but majority were done by Jimmy Smith. He was probably the most prevalent, uh, prevalent maker of the Hardy Perfects. Um, there are ways to tell if your reel uh, did have the letting stripped off. If you look in all the little seams and in all the... Um, all the little grooves and everything along the reel and especially around the foot you can usually tell if there's a little bit of letting left um, so that's one of the things to look out for if someone's ever trying to sell you a spitfire i i would be uh, highly skeptical um, never buy anything without taking a good long look at it <laughs> i'll call you first and have you look <laughs> yeah, you could call me first, but you'll have to be careful because I might a, I might buy it from you. It wasn't a Spitfire, I'll take that. <laughs> but yeah, there's um, that's one of the things I find fascinating about Hardy Perfects is there's so many of them out there, and they all have a story to tell. Or 
I mean, who knows, this, this reel could have landed hundreds of Atlantic salmon in its life. You just don't know. Um, like I say, today we're on a smaller river, so all I have is the small ones with me, but the ones that I really like are the great big four and a halfs and four and a quarters, and um, I, I think those are the interesting ones because those were a lot more prevalent back in uh, the turn of the century because they were using big green heart rods and uh, bamboo and everything, and you needed those bigger reels to balance those rods. So those reels really have a story to tell because who knows how many salmon it landed and who knows who owned it. Um, I saw a while ago that there was actually, at angling auctions in the UK, there was a couple of reels um, actually owned by Aichi Wood and they were like, his initials were uh, carved into the front of the reel. So you never know when these things pop up and the history behind them. And um, I, I, ju I just love them because you're standing there on the river and you know, you're, you're fishing away for steelhead and you think of the journey that your reel's been on. It could have been used in Norway and Russia on the river Spey. It's, uh, and here it is a whole world away, still fishing a hundred years later. And yeah, I, I just, I love them. See, Kirk, that's why you don't skip the horns on your fly. See how those pop out like electric? The two blue lines. values have changed because of fly fishing or the values you always had you brought to fly fishing? Um, I think fly fishing has made me a far more conscientious person. Um, it's made me pay attention to the world around me a lot more. I mean I was born and raised on a farm. Um, I'm used to being out in nature a lot of the time, but um, I think fly fishing makes you pay attention to something bigger than yourself. Because um, the fish, if we just leave them alone to just do their thing, they don't need our help, but we've interfered so much with nature now that we have to start interfering more on the positive side to kind of, I don't know, get them back or hopefully get them back. So I think, I think fly fishing and fly fishing for steelhead, I think it's made me more aware of the, of the world around me and the world on a grander scale and just exactly how fragile it is and how little interferences like plastic in the river or anything like that, you know, can really affect, you know, affect the things that we all love to do. So in all your years of tying and your progression, do you have like an aha moment? Like a, oh, 
why haven't I been doing it this way? Well, I guess, I guess the best one that comes to mind, it wasn't exactly something I figured out on my own, but it was uh, taught to me. Uh, when I was in high school, and this was kind of at the beginning of my adventure into tying classics, uh, the old gentleman that had a shop in uh, Kelowna, it, it was called Ben Shona Custom Rods, and his name was Bill Lynch. And uh, Bill grew up as a ghillie on the River Spey in Scotland. And when I used to go into a shop, I'd bring him a fly every now and again for him to peruse and tell me it's clap. <laughs> and um, so I brought him a spay fly one day and I just could never get the mallard wing to sit down. And he, uh, he took one look at it and he, he pulled the wing back and he says, well, he says, cause you only got one slip on each side. I didn't quite understand what he meant. And then he went back and he got a bronze mallard feather and he took two little clips out of it and he made one just a little smaller than the other and he tucked it underneath the first one. And he went and got a hook and just in hand, he just tied it on there to show me. And it was, it was uh, one of those little realizations that, you know, feathers, feathers are a natural, like a natural product of the world. And you can't just make them do something. You have to figure out um, how to work with a material and not try and force it to do something, but by putting that little slip under there, it created almost like a little cushion. And when you when you cinch the thread down somewhere close to the, the little stem of the clipping that you've made, it, it just seats on there every single time almost perfectly. And that was a real, uh, I guess it was a real aha moment. Um, and it kind of progressed into the future of just trying a million different things to make to make something work so you're not not fighting what you're doing and uh yeah that was that was a that was a pretty good lesson <laughs>